and gentlemen, it is an honor and privilege for me to call upon Mr. Ganesh Chandan, Chief Human Resource Officer, Grief Cotton Limited, to whom we extend a warm and hearty welcome. Hi, good evening. Can everyone see the presentation clearly? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, the topic was what are the emerging challenges for businesses? And when BIMM initially approached me, I thought of this topic because this is something that's very, very passionate uh, personally to me. And many people I interact today over the last couple of years, almost everyone has been talking about this topic. Are we ready as an organization to welcome the new generation, which is most of you? So this presentation is about you. And if you're surprised, why am I talking about it instead of you? That's a different story. But this presentation has been put together by a colleague of mine who is right here and who belongs to your generation. So I thought it would be good that someone who is one amongst you prepares this presentation so that we are able to capture. This is interesting because we are going to talk about the generation that has, who were born between the mid 80s to early 2000, maybe 2002, 2003, depending on whom you ask, it could be even 2005. So people would talk about millennials of the generation, the generation Y, born between 1985 to 2005. And now there's also the next generation that's coming along, which is those who are born after 2005, the mid-2000 onwards, the generation Z. So there are different set of challenges there. So this presentation, because I'm an HR professional, and it, of course it concerns every other business leader as well, is about how do we ensure that our organizations are culture ready to welcome the new generation. So my name is Ganesh Chandan, and I'm the HR person for this company, uh, Graves Cotton. We're a very old organization, 160 years old. Started sometime in 1859, and since then, we've been in existence. For 160 years, we've been doing business. Our businesses have changed, the business model has changed, but the organization continues to remain who we are. Now the challenge for us is that when we come to educational institutions like yours, where we see youngsters like you, the question is, what appeals to you, what attracts to you? So if I were to tell you I work for Facebook and then I'm here to hire, I'm sure everyone would raise their hands. Sure? So if I tell you I'm working for Google or I'm working for Accenture or I'm working for Flipkart, Ola, et cetera, et cetera, it would excite everyone, it would appeal to everyone. Everyone would be standing there. The million dollar question to me is that when I'm representing Greaves organization, which is a 160 year old engineering company, how many of you would get excited? Impressed. That's good. But would it appeal to you, would it excite you the same way as a Google or a Facebook or a Flipkart or a Ola would excite you. I wish I was convinced, but I'm not. But good, I'll still believe this, I'll take this. But I'm not fully convinced. So the challenge for us, not just Greaves, but for many other organization like Greaves, and that could be any large engineering company, steel company, metal company, or refineries, one of those old economy companies, okay? How do they re-energize, reposition themselves to culturally appeal, attract, retain, and motivate all of you, the new generation? And that's what this presentation is all about. So I'm articulating views that have been put together by someone who's one amongst you. So I've tried my best to make it as colorful, as appealing, as I can, but 
as I see it, this is an extension of one of your subject itself. For those who are from MBA HR, in your OB, you must have read about the various generations. How many of you are from HR? Okay, that's a very small number, okay, fairly decent number. So many of you in your OB you would have read about the various generations, the baby boomers, et cetera, et cetera, and the various differences between each generations. Okay, so very soon the, there will be more articles, more write-ups, more discussions about the generation Y. And your OB books, whether you read uh, Robbins or Luthens, depending on whoever you buy, will talk about more about this generation. So, this is the generation we are talking about. Born somewhere between mid 80s to 2000, the generation Y, the millennials, and over the next few slides, we will talk about why are we discussing about them and how this particular generation, including you, pose a very, very serious challenge to the very survival of very old organizations or the older organizations like us. So, this is the organization that is growing in population and very soon 80% of the world's population will be Gen Y. And in most organizations, it could be already happening or quite possible that in the next five to six years, that this generation will represent almost 75% of the workforce. So the big challenge to most of the organizations are, do we know you? Do we understand you? Do we know what excites you? Do we know what are your aspirations? What are your expectations? What motivates you? And that's a big challenge, okay? And if the questions were simple, if the answers were easy, this would not be a big subject for discussion. In Microsoft, there's a huge project that's going on. A part of that project findings has been published in a book called Workforce 2020. And the biggest challenge even for a high-tech company like Microsoft is all about creating or reinventing Microsoft itself to be a very attractive organization for the workforce that will join them in 2020. And this project was started almost seven years back. So they have been working on it for the last dozen odd years trying to figure out. One of the interesting dimensions that's happening is that because of globalization and the way technology has been connecting all of us, one of the biggest influences has been that whether you are a 20-something born in Hyderabad, Chennai, Pune, or London, or New York, the differences have become very, very negligible. Once upon a time, the differences could be significant, very, very vast, but now they become very negligible. The aspirations, the needs, the wants, the kind of awareness, the expectations have become more or less universal. So this Gen Y, in many ways, has become a large universal population cutting across geographical boundaries in many ways. And that's an important aspect. The earlier generations were different. The earlier generations, the Indians were different compared to the Americans who were far more advanced. Those in Western Europe were far more fortunate. They were well developed. They had good exposure. They had good awareness as compared to those in developing countries and underdeveloped countries. But the Gen Y is different. Whether you belong to an underdeveloped country or a developed country, it really doesn't matter. All those geographical boundaries are blurring today. And everyone, in terms of awareness, orientation, expectation, aspirations, are today almost on a very similar level playing field. And that poses a serious challenge as well as an advantage to us. Okay? So, very, very tech savvy. I'm sure all of you are. Is there anyone without a cell phone? Smart answer. Is there anyone who doesn't own a cell phone? Next question, does anyone not even own a smartphone? Okay. So you still have that button on a phone? You are better off. So, okay. So they have more formal education. Okay. And one of the big things is all about multitasking. 
that has become a very, very important hallmark of Gen Y. Ability to do multiple things at the same time because you are now tech enabled. Technology is enabling you to do many things. Okay? So therefore, this generation has higher, greater access to education, information, knowledge, enabled by technology. Why are we talking about them? Okay. So this is a workforce that's going to work along with other generations. And each generation, if you were to go by your own textbooks, are differentiated by the time frame when they were born, and therefore, what were the global influences that were happening around at that point in time, and how those global influences changed their own outlook, their own upbringing, and their own career aspirations and goals. For example, the baby boomers who were born after the World War were very, very, at that seen tough times. They had seen their parents going through tough times during the, both the World Wars, and therefore, they were very particular about having a stable life. They all were focused about making sure they have a stable job, a stable personal life, family values became important. A lot of global influences, all that was happening around that generation, influenced their own outlook towards life, outlook towards career, and everything else. And that happens with every generation, which is characterized by what is happening around. And this generation, the generation Y is going to work alongside generation X, is going to work alongside the baby boomers, and very soon this generation will also be working with generation Z. Okay, that's the one who are going to be born now and probably in another 10 to 12 years, they also would be part of the workforce. So, there are bound to be clashes. The work styles, the work preferences, the leadership styles, people management practices, many of those things would be very, very different. And there are bound to be cultural challenges. And for those who are going to get into people management or people get into leadership positions or those who are getting into HR will always be confronted with this kind of challenges. How do we make sure that culturally we appeal to all the generations, baby boomers, most of them would phase out, most of them would retire, but you'll still have to deal, work alongside generation X, your generation Y, and then you would be dealing with generation Z as well. So the challenge is how do we create a single culture that appeals and enthuses multiple generations? And what are those conflicts and challenges that pose us to organizations? And how do we deal with that? So it's all about differing attitudes, priorities, and habits that are going to pose cultural challenges between each of those generations. And that is the reason why we are talking about. Now, the, one of the advantages of that is that when you have people from Generation X, you also, they also bring you that experience, wisdom, a lot of learnings in life that have been driven by experiences, not information or knowledge, but that have been driven and shaped by real life experiences. So that's available to you. And there is this generation and then the new generation that's going to come along and how you can form synergies that can be beneficial to the organization. At the same time, there would be conflicts, and how does one deal with that? Okay, so, I'm surprised. I, can you see this? Is it clear? Okay. So, by 2025, again, the statistics, because it's global, we pull up from different places, it could be 2020 or it could be 2025, I would, be, I would peg at about 2020 in most organizations that we see, almost 80% of the workforce will be dominated by the millennials. 80% of the workforce. And this is something most organizations are not prepared for. Some of them are working for it, getting ready for it, prepared for it, but many of them simply talk about it, but they are not really doing anything to change or develop their organization to be ready for the millennials. Okay? So, this is an organization, this is a generation that you cannot entice by advertising and media promotion. They are the ones who prefer to do their own research, read reviews, blogs, make their own decisions, 
and they also are, we see this in many, uh, read many articles that how they are becoming increasingly socially responsible, are very particular about buying products or working for organizations or supporting organizations that are socially responsible. More concerned about expressing themselves. It could be in various social media forums. It could be on Twitter, it could be on Facebook, it could be on LinkedIn. The new generation wants to express their own views, ideas, and most importantly, opinions on everything that's happening around. And sometimes that may not go well with many uh, uh, people from the older generation, but that's a reality. A very, very nice uh, example is what a couple of teenage girls from Palgar expressed. They had said about some of their own views and opinions when one of the political leaders passed away and the city came to a standstill. These two girls who were in their teens expressed their views and opinion as to why such a large city or how could such a large city come to a standstill because a popular political leader passed away. Now people attacked them and those two girls had to literally run and hide and it became a big issue for them. That's a typical clash that you would expect in an organization also. The younger generation would feel that they are entitled to make a view or opinion in public express their views in public. The other generations may not be very much in favor of that. There could be clashes in views. So, and everyone believes that they have unlimited potential. Okay. So, uh, many of us believed in our own potential based on our own upbringing, our own education. But the younger generation today, everyone believes that they have unlimited potential all they need is opportunities to grow and develop that. So therefore, in many ways, it becomes a sense of entitlement, okay? And that also poses challenges. And do they respect? Do they give respect to anyone simply based on age, position? No. The newer generation strongly believes, especially the millennials, that you've got to earn your respect from me. Just because you're older to me, just because you're more experienced to me, just because you're senior to me, I'm not going to simply listen to you, but you've got to earn that respect. So these are some of the characteristics that we see. Very impatient. They want change. They want to innovate. They want to try out. In fact, when I was just waiting for this presentation, we were discussing about many real life examples of people wanting to innovate, people wanting to try out, do things. The appetite for risk is very high, and to many, they could appear, you could appear as unstructured and unplanned in your approach towards life and career, but from your point of view, that could be perfectly all right. But it is just that from a conventional perspective, it may not go well, but from the current generation, it would go well. So very, very entrepreneurial. Today, if you go walk across to many of the IAMs, the people wanting to join startups have increased manifold as compared to traditional organizations. So today, in, in my days, being approached by an Hindustan Unilever or a Citibank or a PNG would be a matter of pride. People would get very excited. Oh my God, I mean, I'm going to appear for ITC, I'm going to go to PNG, I'm going to go here. That's changing. Today, Ola is far more exciting. The housing.com that went bust was far more exciting. Your Flipkart is still exciting. Now people want to go to Uber. People want to work for many of the new startups. They could be unknown, but people want to take a chance. People want to try out. People want to experiment. Something which did not exist. And that's because the risk-taking ability is high, and the newer generation is far more entrepreneurial. And why does that have implication in organization? If an organization doesn't offer you that kind of a freedom and flexibility to be able to pursue what interests you, what appeals to you, or what matters to you, you will not be interested. Most of you would just walk away after some time. So therefore, organizations have to give that flexibility, break those hierarchies, and large organizations like us need to become less structured, far more structureless, and become more like a startup from within to be able to sustain the excitement of all of you. 
very, very diverse friendly. For the newer generation, it really doesn't matter whether I'm working with a South Indian, North Indian, or a person from Northeast, or somebody from outside the country. As I said, those geographical boundaries are today, it really doesn't make any sense. People are far more accepting of people from any background, any place, it, it matters nothing. So technology has removed those barriers, but as a generation, those barriers have also gone away. So specific to our topic, let's talk about what are the challenges to the business. One of the biggest challenges, how do we attract? Okay. How do we engage? I'm able to attract, we get you on board, you're inside the organization, so how do we engage with you? Okay. How do we make sure that you are fully committed your heart and soul is in the organization. You're excited about working for us, driving our growth, driving our business. How do we do that? So getting in is the one part. Engaging with you is the second part. And most importantly, how do we retain you? OK? So those are the big questions from an HR point of view. But even for those who are from a non-HR point of view, it's a valuable learning. And one of the biggest challenge for this is how much do we know about the millennials? And this is a multi-million dollar question. Yesterday morning, I was talking to an MD of a very, very large organization, a $2 billion company. And one of the things that he was asking, it was in a, a forum, and one of the things that he was asking me is, Ganesh, I'm 65. Most of my employees are disengaged. And I want to know what is it that we can do to engage with them. I want a very highly engaged workforce, but most of them are disengaged. What is it that I can do? And he said, can you tell me what are those top three things? I said, I'm still trying to figure out myself. And everyone is trying to figure out. Maybe I'll be able to tell you. I can give you a couple of leads, but then I really don't know myself. I'm still trying to explore. And this is a multi-million dollar question. Everyone is trying to figure out. Okay? Everyone is trying to see what is it that we can do. So what I have done is, in this presentation, my colleague has put together some very interesting facts, some statistics that are global, to be able to show to you what are those trend lines. And this is for our understanding. This is for our own education. Okay. Some of the characteristics are that tech savvy, very, very optimistic. So if I lose my job today, I'm not the one who's going to sit and brood. I'm very optimistic that I can find something tomorrow, or if not day after, I will do what I want to do. Doesn't matter. Very, very optimistic, very, very bullish. Very self-reliant. There's very low dependency on anybody else, either on parents, either on peers, either on friends. Whatever I want, whatever I aspire, I'm capable of doing it myself. I'm fairly independent. Okay, self-confident, success-driven. And lifestyle matters a lot, OK? And lifestyle could be extremes. I mean, we have seen people who are getting more carried away by brands, what's happening outside. And then there's another set of the population that's more driven by functionality of various products and services and how they can improve your life. And for some who have gone completely to the other extreme, that I will buy, use only those products that are eco-friendly or made in a socially responsible manner. So you have different lifestyle habits here. People are becoming more health conscious about what to eat, where to eat, what kind of water to drink. Do I get enough time for physical fitness? Do I get enough time to go to the gym, etc.? So those are those other lifestyle preferences and habits that have come. So there are different types of millennials. Okay, One of this is a very popular article that came in Forbes recently. I think that was in June 2017 or Jan 2017, a couple of months old. So you have different kinds of people. So the clean and green millennial is one. That's the generation that's more concerned about wanting to do everything that's socially and ecologically right. And then there's an old school millennial that you will find many in Indians. So although we belong to the new generation, the family influences and the parenting influences have been so strong that 
in terms of time of birth, we represent the new generation, but we're still old school. So you will come across uh, multiple varieties of millennials. Okay, I, I hope somebody would share this so that all of you can read what is in the slide. Okay, and the 10 important facts. Again, different sources will talk about different facts, but one of, one of the slides that's talking here about is there's increased awareness about health, a strong need to be financially independent, financially stable, a strong need to be connected technologically, and a strong need to interact, engage with people. Most of them don't like jobs that, that re requires you to just do a simple programming or something at your desk. Everyone wants to get into occupation that requires a lot of engagement with people, talking to people. So some of those characteristics. Again, depending on which country you belong to, there could be some changes. But by and large, many of the articles that have come, if you go through, a very, very important article that I would like to share with you, it's called the me, me, me generation. Okay, three times me generation. It was a cover story in Time magazine about a couple of years back. Uh, it was written by, uh, CN, CNN uh, news reporter called Joel Estrin, very well-known guy, fantastic article. Even today it remains as one of those classic articles to understand the new millennials. So depending on which author you read, which book you read, you'll find some snapshots about the generation. But a very interesting challenge for organizations today is that most parents also strongly believe that formal education is not that important. Knowledge is important. What is happening is technology is just breaking those barriers of classrooms, educational institutions, and universities, and your ability to dig out knowledge, learn online, on your own, through your own peer group, educating yourself, informing yourself, is becoming far more important. So many people that I talk to tell me that your college degree is less important. What I'm keen to know is how, on your own initiative, you have leveraged technology and networks to be able to acquire a lot of knowledge through informal channels and not just through formal channels. And parents are more okay with that. So if I do an online degree, it's okay. But trust me, in my days, if I do an online degree, in any job, they would just throw the certificate out of the window. Online degree mattered nothing. And for many years, even a correspondence or a distance learning program had almost no weightage. It is something you did because you were passionate and you wanted to learn, you wanted to acquire. But it did not carry much weightage. A formal education, a formal college degree is what mattered. But today that's different. Today people value an online program, people value a distance learning education. Things have changed. But most importantly, informal education, especially in US, you come across people who do homeschooling. You learn at home and then you appear for the exam, you clear it, and then you move on. We see many instances of that as well. Now, when this becomes more popular, more prevalent, what do organizations do? If you still keep insisting, I cannot hire this person simply because he does not have a formal college degree, I may not be able to hire many people. So therefore, we as organizations need to open up and say, what matters is how much of knowledge you have and what skills you bring to the table, your formal degrees become secondary. And this is a shift that would happen in the talent acquisition space. Very, very different is how, this is about mindsets. How do the millennials see themselves and how do they see others? And you'll be surprised to see 60, 10% of them believe that they are self-centered. So that is only a 10% score. When they look at themselves, if you were to ask me as a millennial that are you self-centered, I would say, yeah, 10% of me. But then when you ask them, how do you see others? They say, oh, that person is 48%. So he's like almost 50% narcissistic. 50% is self-centered. So therefore, what the millennials think about themselves and what they think about others is vastly different. In many ways, it is like I am perfect, but the rest of the world is not. 
and that plays an important role. When you look at work, most of them are comfortable spending anywhere between 6 to 13 hours, but in truth is, most of the millennials are comfortable with an uh, 8 hour job. And within that, they would want a huge amount of flexibility. When I come, when I go, and what do I do in between, I want flexibility in that. And most organizations don't offer that flexibility, unfortunately. Okay? And the reason about the work timings is becoming important is because there's a whole lot of aspect on lifestyle. I need my time to interact with my friends, with my peer group, to go to gym, to do my physical fitness. I want to practice for my marathon. I want to play my sports, so I need time for all that. Again, in my generation, everything was work. There was nothing else. Nobody bothered about going to gym, and you can see that in me. Nobody bothered about lifestyle, fitness, or anything. So none of those options or priorities ever existed. You go to work, and you stay there until your boss left. So it's only after he goes, everyone would run away. If he's there for 14 hours, you better sit there for 14 hours. Today, that doesn't happen. I'm sitting there, and everyone goes away. So, my goodness. This is a very interesting slide, but I'm not able to see it myself. This is about how the millennials see themselves and how HR managers look at the millennials. One of the important parts in this slide, when it is shared with you, is that the millennials believe they're very, very loyal, and the HR managers believe that these guys are this much loyal. Okay? So that's a big concern. Uh, the millennials also believe, 86% of them believe they are hardworking. The HR managers believe only 11% are hardworking. Okay? So, and this plays an important role. So what happens in an organization? You attend an interview. The HR manager does the interview and then says, boss, a generation guy. So there's a bunch of guys who want only money. They want to have fun. Nothing else. So that becomes a perception. So this is going to be a huge challenge. But for the millennials, a lot of studies show that purpose and meaning at work is very, very important. Am I doing something that has a larger purpose? How is my work connected with the organization's larger goals? How am I impacting the organization's larger business outcome? Those aspects become more and more important. But on the other side, we just saw what the HR managers think. And what the business leaders think, that's very different. So this is another aspect of cultural clash. But the purpose of work also poses challenges to organizations and their own performance management systems. I'm sure most of you have read about PMS in HR. OK. So one of the important aspects for organizations is that how do we make sure that every single new employee of your generation feels connected with the organization's larger business goals. We have a five-year plan. We have a 10-year plan. How do we make sure that you feel connected with that? I don't know. People keep talking about goals. People keep talking about this vision, that vision. But I'm doing something, and I don't know what is the outcome of it. Do you understand what are the complications of, or the implications of that kind of a perception? It's very different. So. How do we make sure that this happens? And when large number of people, in each batch, when you have large number of people who are joining the workforce, how do we make sure that everyone's individual goals, work goals, are aligned with the organization's larger goals? That becomes a challenge, because you need to focus on building this connect and giving them a strong commitment that there is purpose, there is meaning in what they are doing in the organization. Very, very interesting. I mean, I never thought that something like this slide would come. This shows that bulk of the millennials hate reviews. Allow me to do my job. Don't call me for a weekly review. Don't ask questions. Now I understand why many of my team members get irritated. When I say review karna hai, VCP aajao, most of them run away. Because nobody likes it. So the whole thing is, don't ask me questions. Allow me to do my job. But traditional organizations, many of the leaders have kept themselves busy doing reviews. You need to understand that. Okay? 
सो बल्क ऑफ माई जॉब इज डू टू डू रिव्यूज अभी वो चला जाएगा तो मैं क्या करूंगा मैं किसके साथ मीटिंग करूंगा और किसको क्या पूछूंगा राइट सो दिस इज एन इंटरेस्टिंग एस्पेक्ट विच मीन्स माई एनुअल परफॉर्मेंस अप्राइजर्स ऑल दैट यू हैीन टॉकिंग अबाउट हाउ डू सेट के आर इज यूजिंग द स्मार्ट क्राइटेरिया एक्सेट्रा एक्सेट्रा सडनली हैज अ वेरी ब्लीक फ्यूचर because your annual performance appraisals will very soon get replaced by technology driven constant real time feedback mechanisms which will become more relevant to you and your annual performance appraisal will become meaningless so all that your learning will not hold much value very soon and that is already happening so if the generation deters reviews so much how are you going to manage this so that is for the hr professionals business leaders to think and worry about okay most important in this is the flexibility part of it everyone wants flexibility and flexibility not in just in a very very simple terms about when i come and when i go flexibility more in terms of how do i do my job so i don't want you to tell me at every single step how should i do it just give me the flexibility to decide how to deliver my job and i would like to do that on my own okay and that is where the fear comes in how do i trust this young generation with no experience how do i give something critical and then say you do it and i'm not going to tell you how to do it so my biggest fear would therefore be what the hell is going on i have no idea this generation does not like reviews the generation does not like to be told how the work needs to be done so therefore what am i staring at and this is a concern for us while people want feedback they don't like reviews another interesting slide 85% of the younger generation said that they want real time feedback on my performance as i am doing something as i'm delivering something i want somebody to tell me whether i'm doing something good or bad or what i'm delivering is average i don't want to be told at the end of the year i don't want a review on a regular basis but then i would like to know how am i doing i need that feedback i need that input so which means how do we develop a mechanism to continuously give feedback to people who are spread across different locations i'm sitting in bombay i have somebody in chinchwad i have somebody in ranipet i have somebody in aurangabad how do we give feedback to all these people and that is where technology comes in mobile technology comes in through multiple handheld devices from a smartphone or a tablet how do we reach out to connect interact and engage with the younger generation to give feedback on performance on real time basis again a more in terms of a differentiation one important aspect of it is i'm sure everyone can see the 83 and the 58 percent which is about the mobility the older generation half of them were not willing to relocate easily whereas today what we see is almost 85% of them say from the population that was surveyed that they are willing to move across to any part of the country for a job i am ready to go to anywhere as long as the job excites me so there is increased mobility what does that mean from a talent acquisition point of view you can hire people from any part of the country to work for you okay so earlier if you were operating in south india you would think twice before hiring somebody from rajasthan because you would say us utna dur se koi aayega nahi aur aayega to bhi culturally fit nahi hoga to how do we manage so people would prefer people from nearby states but now that's changing those geographical boundaries within the state are also disappearing because there is increased mobility people are willing to relocate to anywhere and work so what engages them for bulk of them it's about working in teams a lot of appreciation more in terms of instant gratification it is very similar to i i post a beautiful picture of mine on facebook 
and all I am doing for the next one hour is to see how many likes and comments are coming. Okay? So if there are no likes, if there are only 10 to 12 likes, then I have a serious problem in life. Okay? More likes, oh my God, then I need to plan for the next photograph already. Ye Instagram mein jana hai, isko Twitter mein dalna hai, kya karna hai? For that generation, what is extremely important is appreciation from the seniors. So that's like an informal, invisible uh, Facebook where the boss keeps pressing like, like, you did everything, like, like. So that's what exciting. Everybody wants to be in decision-making role. And the last thing that any manager would dare to tell one of your generation people is you lack experience. That's it. Bulk of the mood run away. Nobody wants to hear that. Whether I have experience or not, I have aspirations to be in a leadership role. I want to be involved in decision making. I want to have a say in what is going on. Okay. Now that did not happen. In my generation, if somebody told me, chup chap kaam kuro, we used to do chup chap, I mean calmly. But that doesn't happen nowadays. Whether even with two years experience, three years experience, you see a lot of people moving into much higher roles and responsibilities. When I look at organizational changes that are happening in many of the startups today, I find people with 15 years, 14 years, 13 years of experience, people moving on to the role of a vice president or one of the CXO positions. That simply did not exist in my generation. To be a vice president, you better have nothing less than 20 to 25 years of experience. And to be a CXO, you better have 30 years of experience which means somewhere in your late 40s or early 50s is when you would get into those fancy cabins and company car and all those perks. Today, I personally see a lot of people with 12 to 13 years experience making fancy salaries in holding senior positions. And that is simply because what you bring to the table in terms of expertise has far greater value than the years of experience that you have. That also means that HR has to now look at a talent from a very, very different perspective. This is again what motivates a bulk of them strongly believe that organizations have to be socially responsible. That's the 78% of it. But what drives bulk of them, the 525 of them surveyed said that opportunities to grow in your career opportunities to develop oneself as a professional and as a person were the strongest motivators for continuing with an organization. So the important tool for retention was what will the company do to develop me as a person, as a professional, and what opportunities will the company offer me for my own career progression. So the ideal workplace that offers a lot of challenges, that offers opportunity for us to be creative, that has fun, that is global in terms of its size and scale, and that's dynamic, constantly changing, constantly evolving. So, therefore, one of the biggest questions is how easy it is to engage with the millennials, okay? So, organizations need to realize that they need to be socially responsible, do their business in a very, very ethical way, in a clean and transparent manner to attract the younger generation. If there is no transparency, if we believe that the organization is not clean and fair, socially responsible, it would be difficult to attract. Everyone wants to get connected with the bigger picture, therefore the organizations have to invest in time in with each one of them to connect with the larger organization's business plan and goals, the larger vision and mission, so that everyone feels that whatever they are doing in the organization has a larger purpose and contribution. Training and personal development will become a priority. Organizations will start using technology and new methods to train. Earlier training was all about mandate, so I would have 25 people, 50 people in a classroom to do the training, but today, bulk of the training happens in smaller groups. Can I get 10 people, 15 people who can just sit in a circle to whom we can offer personalized training, a one-on-one -on -one training so that everyone can learn 
and the trainer can make sure that each of those uh, uh, resources sitting in front of us are well trained and they have really understood they are not just sitting there and sleeping, but they are making the most out of it. So, therefore, the personality development part of it becomes important. Larger connect, the need to know what is happening in the organization. If you tell someone that you just do your job and don't worry about what is happening elsewhere, doesn't work well. So, people want a larger connect, people want to know what is happening, even if it doesn't concern me. I may be in HR, I may be in finance, but I want to know what's happening in sales. I want to know what's happening in manufacturing. I want to know what's happening in operations. So gone are the days where organizations could take a position or a stand and say, information is available on need to know basis. If you need to know, I'll tell you. Otherwise, there's no need to tell you. But those days are going away. You have to share what is going on in the organization with everyone to create that connect with bigger picture. People want freedom and balance. A lot of people want to pursue. We just kept talking about some people wanting to pursue a lot of their own hobbies alongside work. A lot of you want that balance between work and life. I'm not going to be a slave to the organization, spend 12 hours, 14 hours working for the company, but I also want time and space to be able to pursue what we want to do. So organizations have to offer that. Leaders who are only results driven, who are only driving work, will no longer survive. You need leaders today who are more engaged, who are more into managing the relationships with the employees, and who are not just transaction driven. Leaders who interact with the employees only when there is work, and if there's no work, they just remain in their cubicles, will find it very difficult to survive. To create a social, and sustainable work environment. You need to create forums, opportunities for everyone in the organization to frequently interact with each other, get together, exchange of ideas, work together, cross-functional teams, a lot of collaboration with each other. That's becoming important. If you simply say you belong to one function and then you do your work there, don't worry about what's happening elsewhere, will no longer work. So training, mentoring, feedback, becomes a part of the bigger picture now. When it comes to sourcing talent, there was a time when uh, everyone would look forward to the Wednesday edition of Times of India because there were four or five pages full of a special supplement which had job openings and everyone would rely on that. Soon all those classifieds disappeared and then people started going to uh, the websites of the organizations or online portals like Nokri, Monster, etc. Today that is shifting. Today people want to connect and interact with each other on LinkedIn so that they can engage with the organization, see what the organization is doing and then make a more informed decision about whether they would be interested in joining or not. So social media presence is becoming important to source talent makes a checklist, which many of them do, which are the organizations that I want to work for, which are the organizations that I'm excited about, and then go to that company's website and then see what are they doing, do they have any opportunities for me, and therefore should I apply for them. So which means organizations have to again redesign, make their company websites more attractive, more exciting, more engaging for the new generation, because that is where people are looking for opportunities. Okay, so the career pages, the traditional career page and all that needs to be revamped to attract and source talent. So post the sourcing, one of the important aspects for organizations is how does the interviewing process happen? How does the selection process happen? How am I treated by the organization in the selection process? That is gaining a lot of importance. So today, when the youngsters go to a store, it is less about a product that they buy. It's less about the service that they get. It's more about the experience of buying. It's more about the experience of going for shopping. So how am I treated? So when youngsters go for an interview, when they want to look for career opportunities, what appeals to them is how does the organization treat me when I participate in the selection process? 
if you make me wait for four hours, I'll walk away. But trust me, when I appeared for my interview, I had to wait for four hours. So that's, that's a cultural shift that we see. So the experience of selection, not just the interview, but what are the tools that you use, what are the techniques you use, and how you conduct the interview is becoming important. So for sourcing, it's all about social media and what you are communicating to rest of the world in the digital space, and then the interviewing experience. Important aspect is that most of the youngsters today don't like to travel or spend money just to appear for an interview. Why can't you use a video conferencing facility? Why can't I appear for the interview over Skype? Why should I travel, spend so much of money to attend for the interview when I don't know whether I'll get selected or not? So the convenience part of it, and then again, how much of information is available to me about the company, its culture, its history, and the role. Okay, so the last two slides. So in terms of engagement, it's about continuous feedback. It's for opportunities for career growth. Incentives, which is mostly the non-monetary part of it. It's not just the money, but what else does your organization offer in terms of benefits, in terms of facilities, in terms of infrastructure, etc. That is becoming very, very important. And then the work-life balance, empowerment, and the last is opportunities to become a leader. And this is going to pose a lot of challenges for people like us. If everyone believes that I need to see a clear path where one day I could be a leader of this organization or a leader of this business, and if I get a feeling that no such opportunity will present itself to me, how many of them would still continue? So there's no clear end to this presentation, to be honest. Simply because the subject by itself is so vast, people are still trying to figure out, people are still trying to plan so that they can understand the younger generation better. They can make cultural changes, process changes, structural changes within the organization to be future ready. And this subject is, is still research in progress. So what I have presented to you is just a snapshot of it. It's not the complete picture. I would urge each one of you to do your research. Go to Google. There are a lot of articles that are available. Read about it. One, because it will help you to understand and define yourself better. And it will also help you in working in your own organization in making it future ready from a culture and structure point of view. Thank you very much. All of you guys have been wonderful. Thank you. It's a fairly long presentation, so you have been very, very patient. A very wonderful audience. Thank you very much. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, your company has seen different era of India, like the British time, then closed economy, then open economy, globalization. What were your different strategies about these eras? Bulk of those times I was not born. Still hey. you're not knowing. Still if this company is there. I'm sorry? Means this company is ex existing for almost 160 years. There has been change in the shift of this strategy according to the situation of India. Yes. So what was that? Staying relevant to times is, is, is the most important question and that's a big challenge for us. For example, let me tell you about the present. Bulk of our business comes from diesel engines of various capacities. A single cylinder, small engine, all the way to a 12 V12 engine that powers an army truck, Shaktiman truck, all the way to a small engine that powers a Piaggio three-wheeler. We are heavily reliant on diesel as a fuel, and across the globe, um, if you were to stay connected on Economic Times or any of those business news magazines, newspapers or websites, 
you will realize that diesel as a fuel is under serious threat because of pollution, emission, changing regulations across the globe. So what are we doing? For the last few years, we've been working on clean energy, automobiles, mobility solutions. And that could be electric vehicles, solar powered gen sets, clean energy powered gen sets. So those are some of the things that we're working on. At every point in time, whenever you realize that your core business is under serious threat, the first thing you do is you need to understand what is the future. What will help you to survive? If you don't plan for that, if you don't prepare for that or do something about it, you will be staring at a dead end and pretty soon you will be another Kodak or you will be a Nokia or you, very soon you will just get out of business. So the challenge for us is we have always been doing. We started with making machinery for the loom industry because cotton was in vogue those days, so that is how we started. And then we started making engines for the fishing industry, for the marine equipment. And then we moved to auto, and then we moved to industrial engines. And now we are talking about clean energy, mobility solutions, and energy solutions. So therefore, at every point in time, the world will offer you an opportunity to get into the future or exit from where you are. So we have always made sure that we look at the future and move there. And that has been one of the reasons, our adaptability to move into the next uh, wave of business that has enabled us to survive and not perish. Most organizations have not survived. Trust me, there are very few nationalized banks that have survived, and Tata's have survived from 1890. But from 1859, I doubt. Unless it's one of those sweet shops that have been managed for generations together who have done it, but very few organizations have survived. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, my name is Maria. I'm specializing in HR from BIMM. Uh, so very recently, 120-odd uh, HR students had gone for their summer internship projects. And uh, during our project presentation, I found that many of my colleagues had uh, studied attrition in the organization. And uh, their major findings was that attrition in millennials, while analyzing the exit interview results, etc., it was found that uh, uh, the uh, millennial employees who were leaving the organization rightly stated that uh, uh, you know uh, they had to pursue uh, uh, higher education or uh, they were choosing uh, for a company uh, offering competitive uh, packages etc but then behind the curtains it was actually found that it was uh, those weren't the real reasons it was either the bo uh, relationship with boss or the um, work working uh, workplace uh, conditions or, uh, you know, lack of diversity in the uh, department of the team, which were actually the reasons why they left, and that was creating frustration among them. But this wasn't really stated in the exit interview forms. Yeah. So uh, why do you think there is such, uh, such a huge, uh, you know, communication gap? And uh, do you think HR is, uh, you know, responsible for this to a great extent? Everybody is responsible, not just HR, every business leader, everyone is responsible for that. Now, the reason, a part of that reason is what my presentation is all about. How do we help everyone in the organization understand the millennials better? If you're able to understand, then what you refer to as a communication gap, you will realize is not actually a communication gap, but it's more of a cultural gap. It's about, I don't understand you, therefore I believe you're irresponsible or you're good for nothing. But trust me, when I was young, that's what my parents told me. They always believed that I'm good for nothing. So my mom's daily prayer was that my son should get a good government job pretty soon before he gets, he becomes totally useless. So she would make me appear for every single state government job exam, central government exam, and every time I flunked, I was not the good guy in my family. So that's what they thought about me. Now that's what I think about you, and that's what you'll think about those who come 10 years down the line. So that is not a communication gap. That is our lack of knowledge, information, awareness about what each generation wants. If I don't understand that, then I seriously have a challenge and conflicts come, people will leave, people will go away. While attrition is a problem, I personally prefer that more than attrition, engagement is a larger concern. I don't want somebody to work for 15 years, but at a suboptimal level or at a disengaged level. Work for me for two years, but in the two years, if you're totally engaged, if you're passionate, 
you deliver most value to the organization, good for everyone. But don't work for 10 years, operating at a 60% level, you are not fully engaged, you are not giving your best, doesn't serve any purpose. So attrition is a secondary concern today. A higher level of engagement with the organization is more important. So it's not a communication gap. In my view, I would refer to that as a cultural gap. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Gratitude is our ability to see the grace of God morning by morning, no matter what else greets us in the course of the day. Good evening, everyone. While thanking the Almighty for his countless blessings, we are here to spell out words of thanks to all those who made this day a valuable memory to carry home. I, Vijeta Sharma, take this opportunity to extend our most sincere thanks to all our guest invitees who have gathered here for their support and cooperation. We raise our hearts in gratitude and thank all the guest speakers for sharing their profound knowledge, experience, and learnings with us. We acknowledge the valuable presence of guest speaker, Mr. Ganesh Chandan, sir, whose guidance to the youth budding managers is valuable. Thank you, sir, for being with us this evening and making us feel proud. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I want to state that we are all most grateful to all the speakers on this stage. We thank you for being here with us today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much.